France and Russia come together in Nanotchka to make us laugh, to make us care, and to show off some gaudy jewels, by jewels, while the Swedish Greta Garbo plays a no-nonsense Russian communist, and it's very funny doing that. Even she couldn't possibly refuse a delicious baguette to go along with her vodka, mix and match and merge. Okay, maybe she could. She has incredible willpower. What this character from 85 years ago, though, couldn't resist is something that you can get in 2024, and that's Spark Plug Coffee. These fantastic beans are the freshest, fairly traded, premium Arabica suckers in the vast country of Canada. Spark Plug delivers to people who live in the U.S. and Canada, and they'll get your order to you within a week. If your address is Canadian, then you won't even have to pay a cent for shipping, or a ruble, or an American dollar, an American cent, a penny. Spark Plug has enough blends and roasts on their menu that Nanachka would probably be disgusted by so much decadence, so many options. Be frugal, she might say. She might even sneer that these Spark people offer rotating seasonal blends. In late 30s Russia, you'll take what we give you and like it. Well, don't tell Nina this then. They also provide half-calf and decaf options. Communists seem to like being in a club, though, and Spark Plug has an autopilot coffee club. Join that and you'll get deals and a whack of perks. Plus, you'll save money on every order. Your freedom of choice means you can customize to get your orders when it suits you. This isn't a Coffee of the Month club, comrades. So your destination, after a lovely working vacation in Paris, is to go to sparkplug.coffee slash H-Y-E-S. Using our H-Y-E-S promo code will save 20% off your next order. That goes for long-standing members or someone who's never even heard of this podcast until today. Okay, I've been weaving details about this movie into the promotional material here. Let's stop pussyfooting around and dig all the way into the one about Garbo, Douglas, Melvin Douglas, and their goofy friends. Bev, let the keyboarder know it's time to play his tune. And action! Have you ever seen... Ninochka. Privet, or privé, comrades, and merci for lending your ear holes to the 569th podcast on this channel known as Have You Ever Seen? Our mission is to look back at classic films and review them from top to tail. That's right, there will be spoilers. I'm the guy whose general appearance is not distasteful, but who sounds more like a Frenchman than Melvin Douglas does in this film, Ryan Ellis. And here's my wife, someone who would never be a cigarette girl in a nice Parisian hotel, nor would she have a photo of Lennon by her bedside, Sergeant Beverly Ellis. That's me. Say that with more sternness in your voice. That's me. Da. Ah, you keep your photo of Lennon in the living room where it belongs. <laughs> I have on a, the wall. A giant portrait of Lennon over Enormous, the fireplace. Enormous, even now. 2024. Today is our third episode in Love and a Word Month. We're talking about romantic movies with one word titles here in February, the Valentine's Month. It's been Arthur and Manhattan so far. And today is Nanachka. So the coming attraction's opinion question for the one where Garbo laughs. The famous moment in Ninochka when Greta Garbo does indeed laugh happens after Melvin Douglas does a pretty good pratfall, and does she ever let loose and cackle at his misfortune? Douglas gives good clumsy, but what do you think is the best and funniest pratfall in motion picture history? Maybe it's this. I can predict what you're going to say. All right, do me first then. Is it Henry Fonda in The Lady Eve? My second favorite is Henry Fonda falling over the sofa in The Lady Eve, which I watched again recently. It was on Criterion, although we have the DVD, I think it is. Criterion DVD. Love that one. My favorite is when the guy playing the Durham mascot goes oof and drops to the ground after Tim Robbins deliberately throws the ball at him in Bull Durham. <laughs> Just hit the bull. Trust me. <laughs> I chuckle and laugh at that, even writing this up earlier today. You wonder if the mascot got a concussion and it was a bit of a mean-spirited thing to do, but still, I laugh at it even thinking about it. But Henry Fonda, Right up there. And so was this. It's a good pratfall in this movie, too. Not worth the laugh she gives, but she had to laugh, obviously, for years. It finally came out. So there you go. That's mine. What about you? Can I pick a cartoon? Does sure. it count? Why not? Well, I just can't stop thinking about when Homer falls down the gorge. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's really fair to count it, except, God, it's just one of the funniest moments in television history. It's one that made me a fan, seeing that episode of The Simpsons. We were just talking about it, so it's fresh in my mind, but, God, probably doesn't count. You need, like, an actor doing a great pratfall, and nothing's really coming to mind except Henry Fonda, so I'll pick Henry Fonda and the Lady mm. Eve, then. That one really holds up. Okay, Nina Ivanovna Yakushova was released by MGM going on 85 years ago, on November 23rd, 1939. I can't really confirm if it was a hit or not, 
but it doesn't appear to have hurt MGM's bank account that year. And how could it, considering how much money they put in the bank in 1939 after Gomp the Wind made all the money in the universe? <laughs> but, Bab, this movie is very old. It's 35 years older than me! So please <laughs> That's remind so us. That's so old! <laughs> And we post this two days before my birthday. So I'll be 50. So please remind us what it's about and give us a skinny on Ninochka. Greta Garbo is Ninochka, a mid-level bureaucrat in the USSR and a true believer in the Soviet cause. Ninochka is sent to Paris to oversee the sale of jewels seized by the party during the revolution. Excuse me? Jewels. jewels. But she is thwarted by Count Leon, a capitalist pig who is trying to get the jewels returned to their former owner. In spite of her devotion to duty, Ninochka warms to Leon's charms and to the Western world. She succeeds in selling the jewels for her countrymen, but she ultimately forsakes the motherland for love. Or, in a nutshell, capitalist converts a commie. Yeah. Sometimes the nutshells are actually to the point. <laughs> Not missing the point, which was the original intention of Movie in a Nutshell. Okay, there are a lot of numbers on Ninochka. Let's go through them all right now. The Rotten Tomatoes critics love this movie. 95% of them say it's good. 8.4 to 10 is the average. There are 40 reviews on the site and 89% of audiences. 40 reviews from a movie that's 85 years old isn't bad at all. It was up for four Oscars. Best Picture, Greta Garbo for Best Actress, Melchior, Melchior Langell's original story, and the Billy Wilder, Charles Brackett, and Walter... Reich or Reich screenplay, a lost picture, actress, and screenplay to Gone with the Wind, and a lost the story Oscar to Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. This went into the National Film Registry in 1990, so the second year they're doing this, this one in, along with 12 others that we've covered, and one that I covered on Scoring the Movies with Chris, so more than half the list now we've covered from 1990. All About Eve, All Quiet on the Western Front, Bringing Up Baby, Duck Soup, Fantasia, a lot of companies, surprisingly, It's Wonderful Life, Raging Bull, Rebel Without a Cause, Red River, Sullivan's Travels, more comedy, The Freshman, that was the Scoring at the Movies one, also a comedy, The Godfather, and The Treasure of the Sierra Madre. Nanashka was 52nd on the AFI's Top 100 Laughs, Some Like It Hot was number one, and 40th on the AFI's Top 100 Passions, Casablanca was number one. I could see this movie being even higher than those two numbers, really. They're good, 52 and 40, but they could even be higher than that. This was up for the AFI's Top 100 Genres in the rom-com category. Didn't make it. Could have done that. But that is a top 10. So that's asking a lot to make the top 10. The 1998 and 2007 AFI Top 100. So the main list could have made those. And two quotes. One is Leon saying to Nanachka, It's midnight. One half of Paris is making love to the other half. And the other one is Nanachka asking Leon, Must you flirt? He says, Well, I don't have to, but I find it natural. And she says, Suppress it. <laughs> That's a better quote, actually. Neither is ever really quoted now, but they're both pretty good quotes. The second quote really relies on the performances to sell it. The first quote is a beautiful bit of writing, but the second quote is really a beautiful bit of performance. The second one needs context, too. Yeah. Just reading that doesn't really mean that much, but her delivery sells it well. And she's great in this film. I loved her in this movie. That's a long list of credentials. What did you think about a movie that John Ford, Akira Kurosawa, and Joseph Goebbels all <laughs> thought was wonderful? If Goebbels liked it, <laughs> who am I? I loved it. This movie's so charming. I'm in love with Melvin Douglas. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also ready to forsake my country for him. But I was also in love with Garbo and her adorable Soviet buddies. It's just really frothy and fun. All these jokes probably land strangely better now because... It's 35 years after the fall of the Soviet Union, and I know some people at the time did criticize it for being anti-communist, although I would say it's much more anti-Soviet or anti-Stalinism. That was a fair opinion back then when Stalin was in charge, and politically it was like a pretty messy time to be messing around with Russia. It's vicious anyway. It was good-naturedly. Well, it's good natured, but it's pretty outright criticism of the way that the Soviet Union operated. Oh, no. With these hyper strict, and then they were like, well, if we screw this up, they kept saying, we're going to Siberia. And no. what was also happening to people is they were getting unalived. <laughs> hmm. But their fear, the way they lived in fear, the way that it was all such a heavy handed disciplinary system for straying at all or enjoying any of the Western world whatsoever. But now, in 2024, you can just enjoy it. As it is, because you're not hurting anyone's feelings when you're watching them tear apart the USSR. When I think about that time and I think about Stalin, the first movie I always think of now is Death of Stalin, that brilliant Iannucci. Iannucci? I guess so. 
Okay, good. <laughs> uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. But the gentleman who created Veep and who made In the Loop, he also made Death of Stalin, which is a pitch black comedy that paints a picture of Russia at that time that is bleak and terrifying and reflected in this movie, too, which is much gentler on Russia. Yeah, especially the brief scenes we see when she's gone back at the end or near the end, at least. And so the comrades... She's got, what, two or even three roommates, and she's an important executive with... What did she even do exactly? Well, I guess she just oversees missions. But she's got to share a space because this is the way it is back here. And there's the guy that has to go through their room to get to his room. They don't have privacy because... He's spying them. I didn't really know about this until you and I covered Dr. Zhivago that after the revolution in Russia, they confiscated all those rich people's homes and just gave all their their homes... And their jewels. People just lived in these old, beautiful mansions, but they would live like several people to a room and the mansions are built for one family but you have dozens of people living in one of these giant houses it wouldn't be designed for people to split it up into apartments so you would have to have a guy go through her apartment to get to the next one and this is set in pre-world war ii paris which they are quite clear about in the beginning of the film war has broken out in europe at this time yeah okay but it's still very new (laughs) but it's still very new and nobody really knows what's going on and not everybody has joined the war effort America wasn't in the war efforts at this point, for sure. So they make the point at the beginning to say, oh, this is set in a glorious time before Paris was besought by war. And they... Saved by the Americans. So, no, well, they didn't know that in 1939. Well, of course not, but Americans will take credit for saving France. Oh, yeah, but it worked for me. Really, no, ironically, German. it was the Russians. The who Russians, yes. Really were the heroes of World War Two, as were America and Canada and many other countries, but... It was really more the Russians that stopped that war. I said in the intro that Melvin Douglas, and I like him a lot too in this movie, like you do, but he doesn't even try to be French. <laughs> oh, no. Why At least I Garbo and the three guys, and almost nobody is Russian. Garbo, of course, is Swedish. I don't think any of those three guys are Russian. I know that Sig Ruhm and, and Felix Brassart are not. But isn't Leon supposed to be Russian? Isn't he a former... I thought he was French. Well, he's, he's a count. French. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. But his paramour at the beginning of the film... Swana. Swana. She's a she's former... Russian. Or, oh, okay. or Russian, yes. Yeah. It's she her... was one of the aristocrats that were chased out of the country. And then one of the coincidences in this movie, there's two big coincidences in this movie, maybe more, but two for sure. One is that the jewels that these guys bring are hers and she's in that same hotel. And then so is Rakonin, this is how you say his name, who was a noble and now he's a waiter in that hotel. Who can, understands what's going on, understands the mm. Russian and can translate it. And because this movie's charming and funny, we'll let that slide. But that is one hell of a lucky coincidence (laughs) that those two people are both there. And then at the end, there's not a lot of plot in this movie, but the plot ends up being that they steal the jewels, the jewels, and it gets Garbo in a little bit of trouble, Ninochka in a little bit of trouble. Nina, I guess really is what it is. Apparently Ninochka means, and you should be pronouncing it, I guess, Ninochka more, or Ninochka or something like that. You emphasize the Nin rather than the Och, but in this movie, Douglas and others are always saying Ninochka. But that's a feminine name for Russians to say little girl or even great granddaughter. Yeah, when you add a K to the end of a name, it's like the way we add E. My name's Bev, but my sister affectionately calls me Bevy. Mm-hmm. If I was Russian, she would call me Bevka. Ivanka's real name is Ivana, but they call her Ivanka. Her mother was Ivana, and so she was always the diminutive version of that name. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, the comrades, the three of them, are trying to sell to Mercier in the beginning of the film. And then Leon files an injunction against the sale. And ironically, he falls in love pretty quickly with a woman. And she falls in love back not that long after. But he's first falling in love with a woman who goes over there to help the sale happen, which isn't happening because of him. She doesn't know that at first. Yeah, there's a meet cute movie. There's a meet cute thing in this, too. She wants to go see the Eiffel Tower. And at this point, I think... She's such a true believer that she's convinced herself the only reason she wants to see the Eiffel Tower is to study it, study its engineer. Subject of study. Subject of study. It's Paris. You want to go see the Eiffel Tower. It's romantic. It's beautiful. It's a world wonder, especially in 1939. It would have been a true sight to see. And yeah, he takes her there. He's obviously attracted to her because she's Greta Garbo. They have this chemistry right from the jump. And it takes them the whole night before they even put together. Another coincidence is that he gets this phone call when she's in his apartment. Something's about to happen. But then he gets the call and she overhears him talking about the jewels. Mm-hmm. I love that she does quote the famous line from Grand Hotel where she said, 
I want to be alone. She said, I want, but everyone's always going to say, I want. And this, she says to what is an assistant or a porter or something in the hotel, a maid or something like that. We want to be alone. <laughs> and I think that was intentional by Wilder sure. and the writing team to play off a grand hotel, which was seven years earlier. The Best Picture winner, the only other time we've covered Garbo before this. I wasn't a huge fan of her in that movie. I thought she did a good job, but I don't get the praise for that. I've seen other things she's done, but it had been a long time. It has been a long time since I've seen anything else she's done. I've seen this before. It's been a long time. You've never seen it before, though, right? No, no, first time. If this was all she ever did, I'd say, do this forever. You're so good at comedy. Maybe because she's playing off... Well, she wasn't stern, exactly, and Camille, and I can't think of the other movie she did right now, but some of her famous titles. But she was the tragic heroine a lot of the time. What is the line in the passion special the AFI did where... What's her name again? I think it's Ann Mira, so Jerry Stiller's wife, said she's dying in a key light. I think it's when they did Camille, actually. That's great. And she's laying there. Oh, I'll always remember you, whatever the boyfriend's <laughs> name is. <sighs> but looking beautiful with a perfect key light. I've said it a hundred times. Comedy is commitment. And Garbo is she so really committed. She's legitimately funny. You would describe the premise of this film, how this was her big foray into comedy. And she had always played so serious the melodrama. But she is a natural. She plays this stern, loyal bureaucrat with full commitment. And then later, when it's time for the pathos, your heart really does break with her when she has to choose between country and love. Mm -hmm. She chooses country because she knows that if she doesn't sell the jewels, that her countrymen will starve. And that's just too big of a price to pay. So she gives up her love. She goes back to Russia. And then he contrives to get her back with him. And then they'll never part again, of course. Because they opened a restaurant. <laughs> yeah. The comrades do, yeah. Yeah. Well, he's got money and power. He can't get into the country, Russia, because he's a count. Yeah. He's a nobleman. None of those allowed. The movie isn't that funny for a little while, even with the three guys. So I didn't say their names yet. So they are Iranovov. That's Sig Ruman. I'll pronounce these names wrong, I'm sure. Bulyanov, and that's Felix Bressart. And Kapolsky, who's Alexander Granik. They're the three comrades I keep referring to. But the movie does get funny when he charms them by getting them drunk and then having the cigarette girls go up there. And maybe they're just hanging out with them and entertaining them. Maybe there's more going on there. In a movie 1939, you're never going to see anything that's all that untoward in the first place. But they have fun. They have these great clothes on. And then as soon as she comes, they dress back down again to the clothes they had on before. I think I read somewhere that they all dress, the three of them, in stereotypical Russian clothes. I think one of them is supposed to be a Tolstoy stand-in. And I forget who the other two were in the first place. But anyway, they have these ordinary utilitarian Russian clothes for a while. Then they're more in the top hat and tails type outfits. But then when she's coming, no, we got to go back the way we were before. But they're willing to compromise, and it's because he does grease the wheels. But there's no better way of using the outfits and storytelling than the infamous scene with the hat. On the coat rack. At first she sees Hats, the hat. right? Oh, no, well, her no, hat, so right. there's one hat that she sees, which... But there's the three hats that they have you see on a coat rack as well, or coat hook. Oh, okay. Right. But I'm thinking of, like, her transformation yeah. because she has this beautifully... What a weird, ugly hat, too. It is such an ugly hat. I guess this was stylish in 1939, and I'm sure that there are clothes now that would be desirable in 2024 that 80 years plus from now, people will be like, I'm sorry, they want to wear what? They want the Stanley Cups or whatever it is that's so popular now. It's going to seem ridiculous nearly a century in the future. But we as the audience know from all the signals, it's a valuable hat. It has caught her attention. And at first she has to point out how it's a ridiculous symbol of frivolity. But of course she notices it because she likes it. And then when she starts to soften, when she has to fit into French life, what does she do? She buys the hat and she wears it and she loves it and she feels good in it. It's part of this loosening up that she does. It's not like she becomes this ridiculous over-the-top capitalist or something mm -hmm. overnight. It's just more loosening up those strict bonds that keep her from having any fun because she is a very humorless person at the beginning of the film. Well, there's people last year that were looking at money troubles that seem to have eased up finally. You and I even realized that we have to have some time. We're not going to yeah. go on vacation and we're not going to buy anything extravagant, but we had to have a meal out once in a while or order in. And we couldn't just live completely frugally forever and ever. We weren't that poor. And even a lot of Russians back in this time frame, the Soviets, needed to realize, and they probably weren't allowed to, that you can do something for yourself once in a while. And if you're a good country person, you're probably not going to do it often, but maybe have one night of fun. A lot of people have accused this film of being anti-communist. And this is where it becomes political, something that's not really anybody worries about now, but certainly in the 30s, it was a deal. 
So the film is supposed to be anti-communist, but I think it's more anti-Stalinism. Communism is one thing, but what the film is really criticizing is this complete rigidity, this way that everybody has to conform to this one same thing and nobody can have any weaknesses. Nobody can indulge in anything ever that makes you a bad countryman. It's like in modern social media. Are you following exactly what everyone thinks? Yeah, except a group that think? nobody's going to send you to Siberia. They'll try. If you, no, they will not. <laughs> no, Stalin was brutal for that. Isn't he the biggest murderer of the 20th century? Even more oh, than tw- Hitler or Pol Pot? Oh, that's a great question. He might of his be. own people all the of time, too. Of his own too. people, yeah. That, I think, undisputedly, I he think has the record. Chairman Mao also is in yeah. the running for that. It's funny to think that England and America and... Russia, many other countries, but those three were major allies through so much of World War, I guess all of World War II, and then almost immediately after, Russia was not an ally of America and Britain and so on. And for the record, MGM tried to re-release this film during World War II, but it was suppressed since the Soviets were allies at that point and America didn't want to upset Stalin. You don't need to re-release movies. That's one reason, by the way, we mentioned Gone with the Wind being such a big hit for MGM the same year as this. That was a great year for movies, 1939, and MGM had, I don't know how many, well, three I can think of for sure, Gone with the Wind, this, and Wizard of Oz. Wizard of Oz didn't succeed. This did okay, as I recall. Gone with the Wind was such a big hit. But part of why Gone with the Wind's numbers are so awesome are re-releases. It's not like they're the only film that's done that. How many times has Star Wars been re-released? True. The only way to see Gone with the Wind for decades was in the theaters so there was a demand that people wanted to see the movie it's over and over years. again yeah. yeah it's been 10 years let's watch it again if your box office numbers could include home media i think star wars would eclipse most films you talk about all the things that go into making money star wars does eclipse gone with the wind we don't know but probably because of ancillary oh, stuff like there aren't toys for gone with yeah, the wind but there yeah. are for star wars Thousands and thousands of characters, probably not thousands, but hundreds of characters. Never spawned a whole franchise of films if you were to include all the films that are part of the Star Wars universe. There's also no Nanachka 2. No. (laughs) (laughs) Or Gone with the Wind 2, for that matter. Nanachka 2, the three comrades find love, (laughs) (laughs) which I totally would see. I would totally watch that. Pretty charming guys, yeah. They do have that restaurant in the end in Constantinople. Yeah, and isn't one of them protesting outside because his name yes, isn't like big enough in the sun? The last shot. A very capitalist thing to do, by the way. They are truly right, that's converted true. to... <laughs> and that's the last scene. A fun way to end this comedy. This movie is very funny, ending on this guy protesting his own restaurant. As a rom-com, it has a relatively simple and effective method of keeping the two lovers apart, which is always like a key thing for a rom-com plot to make it believable Part of the reason rom-coms don't work anymore is because there's just fewer and fewer things keeping couples apart. But here we have a nice story. But I think what makes it really deeply lovable is that Ninochka changes because she wants to, not because Leon manipulates her. He loves her from the beginning. He loves the stern version of Ninochka. He doesn't want to change her. (laughs) All he wants to do is win her over the way she is. So when she lightens up... It's because Leon makes her happy. It's love that changes her instead of her changing for love. I just root for them so hard. More than most rom-coms I watch, which there are plenty of problematic rom-coms. The rom-com that we're going to talk about next week. I'm not going to root for that couple quite the same (laughs) Sabrina. (laughs) Sabrina. There's some pretty manipulative, weird stuff that goes on in this rather convoluted story that brings the two people together. Very charming film, but not as convincing as the love between these two. And, of course, it doesn't hurt that the two actors are incredibly charming and have this great chemistry together. Well, also when they kiss that night when they go up to the Eiffel Tower, which, by the way, she walks up and beats him when he takes the elevator. Yeah. That's a good touch. She's hardcore, man. (laughs) She's fast. (laughs) But he just makes him like her more, you know? I love that about him. Not sweating either. Yeah. But when they do kiss, she says, again. (laughs) One of the funnier kiss exchanges in movie history. Graduates probably get, if not the best, certainly one of the best, when Dustin Hoffman kisses and Bancroft. Her eyes are wide open as he kisses her. He pulls away, and she blows the smoke out of her face. That's a great <laughs> laugh moment. But this one, too. Again. <laughs> <laughs> there aren't any terrible villains in the film. The villains aren't that villainous. You can easily understand why the Duchess Swana wants, wants her, her jewels, jewels back. back. They Those were her jewels. jewels. Yeah. Yeah, right? They were taken from her. There is equal parts of you that are like, but those jewels should go to feed the Russian people. But those are her jewels. You had no right to take them. What are you talking about? 
And you can understand why she would want Leon back. Well, you can have the jewels back, but you have to leave Leon behind and let me have him back. She saw him first. They work together at the beginning mm-hmm. of the film. It's a little confusing at the beginning because I was like, are those two different people? Isn't that guy with Swana? Are we supposed to root for this couple for him to cheat on his girlfriend? But I guess they're not the most well-established couple. <laughs> okay, yeah. So, yeah, Swana's not cruel. Yes, she's selfish, I guess. She's not you vicious. Her, but she's not vicious. She has a pretty sympathetic character as well. Well, the famous scene I talked about in the trivia, or the opinion question, I guess, is when Leon wants her to laugh. And I guess that's the whole appeal of this movie. I think this is why they even decided to make it. We can build it on Garbo Talks was a thing in 1930-ish, wherever it was, where she spoke for the first, first time. talkie, yeah. And now, about 10 years later, it's Garbo Laughs. When he gets a laugh out of her, it's accidental. He's trying to tell all these jokes. She doesn't laugh at any of these things. He thinks they're so funny. But then when he just slips and falls, he leans back, puts his elbow on the table and misses and then falls over. The guys in that restaurant laugh and that makes her laugh. She goes really over the top with it, but it's still pretty charming. And there are times I've seen movies where what happened wasn't that funny, but the reaction of other people made me laugh. This is exhibit A. Another endearing thing about him as a character is that he rolls with the punches. Mm-hmm. His ego doesn't get in the way. He's just like, okay, well, whatever. She he wanted her to laugh. So, yeah, she's exactly. laughing. Exactly. He doesn't take it personally. He's not humiliated. And she's still laughing at a meeting, which I think is the next day or later that day, <laughs> yeah. I suppose. But then Krusty the Clown even said in The Simpsons, it's funny when the gentleman is embarrassed, which is how Sideshow Bob became his Sideshow character because he was this proper gentleman with a pie in the face. Yeah. Well, Melvin Douglas is this proper count falling over in the restaurant, that's why it's funny. And from that moment on, Ninochka never gets that stern composure back. Right. That just cracks the surface and she can never really get back to that. Well, she has it a little bit, but it's really being peeled back quickly. Yeah. Maybe more fair to say. And then she gets drunk. (laughs) Yes. As does he. She drinks too much champagne. Oh my God, her performance when she's drinking the champagne, she's almost like that meme. Ew, wait. Oh. (laughs) (laughs) It's pretty lovely. Yeah, and then they end up back in the room, and he opens up the safe, puts the diamond tiara on her head, and that's how Raconan is able to steal the jewels. So it's a plotty thing here, but it does make basic sense because they're messing around in it's a fun way. It's never too busy either. Yeah. So I want to talk to you about this because I know you know way more about it than I do. Before we watched it, you said, we're going to watch the Lubitsch film. It's the Lubitsch touch. Mm-hmm. I'm not that familiar with Lubitsch, so talk to me about this. What is the Lubitsch touch? And I should clarify, Ernst Lubitsch is the director of Oh, we've not said his name this whole time? We haven't, have we? I don't know, haven't we? Wow. Because this is one of his quintessential movies. I did Shop Around the Corner two Decembers ago. He also did a movie we've talked about a lot of times but haven't covered, and we probably should, because it really is funny, To Be or Not To Be. And he did Trouble in Paradise, which is a pretty famous one as well. But the Lubitsch touch, I'm trying to find a definition of it online here, The Lubitsch touch is a phrase that has long been used to describe the unique style and cinematic trademarks of director Ernst Lubitsch. (laughs) Thanks. Doesn't doesn't help us at all, does it? (laughs) But I think it's supposed to be this light comedy and maybe weaving in plot elements and making that all work. I don't know if Wilder came up with that expression, but he wrote for, obviously, this movie, and I think he may have done, maybe not other Lubitsches, but I do remember reading somewhere that when he died, Wilder and some other famous director were at the funeral, and they said, oh, no, no more Ernst Lubitsch. Wilder said, no more Lubitsch movies, which is a little bit more unfair. (laughs) You wish your friend would live, but he's right. This is one of the unsung great directors. I think when you do a director's poll, the greatest of all time, he may not make it, but he's somewhere in that conversation at least. And this is a guy that's probably been lost to history because Nanashka is probably remembered, but I don't know if Trouble in Paradise is, Shop Around the Corner, maybe because of the You've Got Mail connection, which is 25 years old, 26 years old now itself. And what's the other one I said he did? To Be or Not To Be, which Mel Brooks did, but that's also over 40 years old now. But Lubitsch is one of those rom-com directors. If you talked about the greatest rom-com directors of all time, Wilder's in that conversation, even though he hadn't directed at this point yet in 1939. And the next film we're going to cover is a Wilder film. Which is a rom-com. But Lubitsch is certainly in that short list, too. I'm never going to slander Wilder at all, but I think his rom-coms in particular, they have a heavy touch. (laughs) They can get pretty dark at times, but also I find his plots can get pretty messy, particularly in his comedies. There's just something that has such a perfect flow in this film. And now it's a wilder script, and I'm sure that doesn't hurt. 
but to describe it as the Lubitsch touch, you can see in this film that there is just this ease, this natural grace with the way that the story flows and the comedy flows and the way it feels like you never touch ground yeah. when you're watching it. Does that make sense? Yeah, we're covering... Even though it's like a fairly heavy subject matter at times. Mm-hmm. I'm looking at the calendar. We're covering six movies this month. I think this is the one I'd rather watch again more than any other and maybe many times over. Manhattan is very funny. It's a great movie despite Woody Allen making it. I mean, there's a reason you covered it on your own and not with me. True. <laughs> so that is a fantastic film I will probably watch again one day. I'm not reviewing any more Woody Allen movies. I don't want to do that. I did it once recently. We've done three of them in total. But this movie really does hold up as a fun, classic comedy. This movie and To Be or Not To Be are legit funny. And we're always saying this. You and I have said this many times over. The old movies, apart from Lady Eve, Singing in the Rain, and what am I always saying is the other one? Maybe Some Like It Hot. Wizard of Oz is pretty funny. Some Like It Hot, we're getting it almost 1960. But sure. we're talking about 1940, maybe into 1950. Those movies that are supposed to be these great, hilarious comedies don't make us laugh. But this did, and so did To Be or Not To Be. We watch it after we watch Arthur, which we covered last week. And in the first 15 minutes of this movie, I laughed more than I laughed in all of Arthur. This comedy aged way better than a film that's half of its age. Yeah, it's true. Maybe part of that is because the funniest part is in the first half of this. We record this the day before Groundhog Day. I love that as a comedy, but it's way funnier in the first half when he's being bad Phil, if you will. Just like this is way funnier in the first half when she's being stern Nanochka. Fair enough. I wonder if Lubitsch has suffered the same fate that I see Rob Reiner suffering now, or even like Zemeckis. There are directors who are so competent at making a smooth movie that is so thoroughly entertaining and easy to watch. And truly funny films. Truly funny movies that have aged well. Nobody really seems to talk about them with the great directors, and I think it's because they just make it look too easy. Yeah. Wilder, you can see the strings in a Billy Wilder movie more so than something like this. Comparing it to Sabrina, because of course we just watched it, which was a film I enjoyed. I'm not trying to slander it. But I think sometimes directors are not considered the greats simply because... It looks effortless. It looks so effortless. So back to some plot matters. We talked about how the Stalin Russia, they were being critical of that. One thing is censorship. Leon sends a letter back that is so censored is what, just Dear Nanochka, <laughs> Love share, Leon or something? Share Nanochka, Love Leon, everything else is blacked yeah. out. And then we see the one scene with Bela Lugosi in this movie. We've covered him in Dracula, and now this. He has one scene, he's very convincing. When it was over, I paused the movie and said, do you recognize who that was? Nope. And it was Bela Lugosi. So, so he's Razanin. He has such a small part. Is this a cameo or is this when he was struggling he, to work? As big as he was after Dracula, he didn't continue being that big. Because he didn't do that many more big titles. Island of Lost Souls was the year after Dracula. And I think that was pretty successful in its time. He was the Sayer of the Law, I believe is the character's name. And that's a pretty effective thing. But he didn't keep on making the Dracula movies. Didn't want to play the character again. And he lost out on that stardom he maybe could have had by being Dracula. So yes, this is just a working actor. He's very convincing in that one scene, though. And I don't think he recognized him. So he's more of a character actor. I think even the ending actually, for the most part, makes sense because this is all about diplomacy and passports and all this other stuff to get the three guys to Constantinople, which I guess that was also Leon's doing. He's using his power and influence and money. And then they stay, which is what happened with defection so often. Defection could be, as they show, and I think it's White Knights with Barishnikov, a dangerous thing for Russians or anyone else beyond the Iron Curtain for so many years to get out of that and stay in wherever, America or maybe Canada or maybe Brazil or I don't know, anywhere not behind the Iron Curtain. That was probably dangerous sometimes, but other times it's like immigration is now from Mexico and Honduras and Bolivia. You go to America and you just stay. That's what these guys did by going to Turkey. They went there and they stayed. At least as far as the story goes, who knows if the restaurant succeeded. If it didn't succeed, do they call Leon and say, help, or do they go back (laughs) home again? But then Nanachka is going to be with Leon, and he's got the money, and he loves her. So I guess even beyond this movie, they must have a happy ending. Yeah, she's going to defect. The three comrades have already defected. And this is part of the thing about Soviet Russia being irrational, that they made it so hard for them to do what they want to do. For a good subject. Because she's really good. You want to lose this talented person who loved her country and would have continued being part of it. But if you're going to make it be, I can't be with him, 
and then also still be a Russian, then I'm going to go be with him and to hell with Russia then. I can't get this out of my head. I just finished this incredible memoir about cults called Uncultured. The woman who wrote it grew up in a cult and studied mind control techniques. She doesn't put it like that, but... I cannot get out of my head that Stalin ran the country like a cult. And all the little markers that would make something a cult, you get punished for leaving. They try to control your thoughts. People tell on each other. And there's this whole surveillance culture. The whole thing was a cult, the way he ran the country. Especially such a big country. How do you maintain that very well? And I guess he did, but... He did until, you know... It's irrational. (laughs) I can never imagine what would have happened to that country had he not died relatively young and unexpectedly. So Greta Garbo was nominated for four Oscars, but two of them were in 1930. That was back when you could do that kind of thing. So really three Oscars, three separate years anyway. One of them was for this, of course. We covered Grand Hotel. She's part of that Best Picture winner. This was her second last film. She did, I think it was another comedy character the year after this or around the same time frame. It didn't succeed at all. And then she said, I'm out of this. And we talked about it on Grand Hotel. She decided she just wanted to live her life, be with friends, socialize and enjoy herself when she wasn't that old. It wasn't like anything went wrong. She wasn't insane. She wasn't injured. She, she wasn't drummed out of the business. She took the money and ran. Yeah. I've had enough. I've done great stuff. I'm gone. She often played the title character. I was looking through her resume. I mentioned Camille and obviously Nanochka and many other films. She was the literal title character. If not the name, as in Camille, it would be that the character is about her. So she was truly one of the great stars of all time. And this was not her comfort zone at all. She wasn't used to comedy or vulgarity, but she did it so well. Yeah. Huge applause for her. I didn't really rave about her in Grand Hotel, but I loved her in this. She's the I best. did love her in Grand Hotel. She's the best thing in this, though. Melvin Douglas. He's up there. She's together. Better. Them together, their chemistry ugh, makes the movie. I he's wish so charming. That he has some kind of even slight French accent. Or if he's... <laughs> well, he's Leon, right? So maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, he's supposed no, to be no, Russian. Right. I think you're right. Maybe he's, he's supposed French. to be a Russian yeah. expatriate. But he's a count. He, he sounds exactly like he's American. <laughs> I've been trying. Mervyn Douglas was an Oscar winner for Hood and Being There. See? How hard is that? Uh, <laughs> oh, top... very convincing French accent. But I wasn't really trying that hard. <laughs> Ooh la la. Oh, yeah. Mon chéri and Hood. <laughs> Hood there's waiting on me to die. And he ain't a patient man. We covered Hood many years ago. Love that film. He's Love also that. Redford's dad in The Candidate, which we covered oh, about a year and a half ago. Another great film. Ina Claire is Swana. She was a Broadway star, only made a dozen films. Her last movie was only four years later in 1943. Then you got the three guys. Sig Ruman was in A Night at the Opera, the Marx Brothers film, To Be or Not to Be. And he was Schultz in Stalag 17, which I covered just last year, which was also a Wilder film. Well, he didn't direct this. He directed that. Felix Bressart was in The Shop Around the Corner, which I covered, I guess it must be almost a year, well, not a year and a half, I guess, but two Decembers ago. Man, time is just blue, blue. And To Be or Not to Be. I think he's the guy that's always saying, it will get such a laugh. I like that guy a lot in that film. Although the guy who plays Hitler has two of my favorite laughs of all time. I on myself. That's funny. And also when he goes to the two guys, the two pilots, the German pilots, they're on the plane. Everybody on the plane is their people, not Germans. Jump. Makes them jump out the door and they do. (laughs) Just jump to their deaths. You forget. But if we watch To Be or Not To Be. I've never seen it. We watched it together. We, we talked did? about it before, yes. Oh my God, really? We just watched it to enjoy ourselves, and we brought up another podcast. But it was years ago. It was our old house, so it's been at least three years. What was I drinking? <laughs> Very funny film. And then Alexander Granik is the third guy. He was in Nosferatu. He's Nock. Is that the main human, or is that the crazy I think it's Renfield crazy. guy? I think it's so Renfield. So Renfield stand-in. Okay, yeah. So. That makes sense. He looks more like Renfield would. He had uncredited roles in The Hunchback of Notre Dame... Same year as this, and Foreign Correspondent, the Hitchcock film, the year after this. And then Bela Lugosi was only in that one scene in this film, did Dracula, and then trash films with Ed Wood in the 1950s, many others. But Bela Lugosi is one of the biggest names in cinema history, and yet he didn't do that many big or good films. But he's pretty effective in his one scene in this film. Not at all scary, like he wasn't Dracula, not funny, but effective. Ernst Lubitsch did direct The Shop Around the Corner, To Be or Not To Be. Heaven Can Wait another one I didn't mention before. That was a few years after this. Billy Wilder, Charles Brackett, his regular writing partner from around this time, obviously, and then many years later when Wilder started directing films, and Walter Reischer, Reischer, whatever his name is, who won an Oscar for Titanic, not the James Cameron one, but from the 50s. So he won the screenplay Oscar in 1953, I believe it was. They all wrote this. Wilder wanted Lubitsch to get a writing credit because I guess he did an awful lot of writing, but the Guild denied it. That's pretty cool of a writer because it's usually that the writer says, no, the director didn't write this with me. I think we said this on 12 Years a Slave. That was the John Ridley problem with Steve McQueen. 
Steve McQueen wanted a writing credit on it, didn't get it. Ridley, I guess, was part of the reason why he didn't. And here's the writer saying, no, the director should get writing credit and did not. When they wrote this film, Wilder and Brackett, they were relatively unknown. But this incredible screenplay and the success of this movie launched them into some pretty famous careers. Maybe you've heard of them. Bill Wilder. <laughs> We're going to talk about him next week, so his credits will get mentioned more thoroughly then. Lubitsch was an executive producer on this movie. He often produced his own films, and Sidney Franklin was an associate producer on this. He also worked on Mrs. Miniver, which was several years later, Best Picture winner, and often directed films. But I guess MGM was just the producer because they're executive producer and associate producer. The movie is 133 to 1, so the old Academy ratio. We watched the black and white print on Turner Classic Movies with serious system noise galore. It just did not stop. Cinematographer William Daniels also shot The Shop Around the Corner, Harvey, oh Harvey, and Cat in a Hot Tin Roof. We've covered all those films. The editor, Gene Ruggiero, 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 whatever. This was only his second movie as a cutter. He also did cut The Shop Around the Corner, which was, I guess, the year after this. And he won the Oscar for Around the World in 80 Days. That won the Oscar for editing. Hmm, long epic. And the mm-hmm. composer of music, Werner, or probably Werner, Heyman, did the music for The Shop Around the Corner and To Be or Not To Be. So, black and white film, what do you think of the look, the cutting, the music? Oh, it's pretty immaculate. I think it's beautiful. I think everything comes together to make a really lovely, consistent tone. It's a great-looking movie. I don't remember the score. I don't either. <laughs> Which, honestly, for a movie from 1939, for the score not to impose itself on me... Oh, I don't know. That, back actually... in that era, a lot of times it was just the opening and closing when you get much in the way of music. That's true. But I think about Gone with the Wind, where it just feels like they blanketed that film with score. It doesn't seem to even particularly go with some of the scenes at times. So kudos for not overdoing it, which is mm. one of my pet peeves. For a movie of this type, comedy, not trying to be too big and grandiose, it looks pretty good, sounds pretty good, notwithstanding the fact that we heard a lot of (laughs) which we often do in these old films recorded off our cable provider. What happens next? I'd like to see Nanachka go back to being stern because she was funnier that way. Plus, she was very competent. When she's smitten with love, will she still be so competent? And he loves her like that. That's right. Although it's also nice to see Garbo get to play it loose and have fun in a movie. Usually she was so melodramatic, like in the Camille-type films. And that's one reason why I wasn't her biggest fan. But in this movie, I am a giant fan, even though love made her soft. (laughs) But she and Douglas are really fun together. And the three comrades, too. When they make that omelet together when they're back in Russia, that's a pretty sweet scene. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right, then. Last thoughts on our only second movie that you and I have covered, but our third of the month, Ninochka. Well, my final thoughts are, I guess it's time for me to start really catching up on some Lubitsch films. I'll start with to be or not to be. (laughs) (laughs) We should cover it because it made the comedies list. And I love that movie. There's so many great laughs in that. I talked about a few of them that you didn't recognize. But Jack Benny is a comedy legend. He's quite funny in that movie. And Carol Lombard, who we covered in My Man Godfrey a few years ago, is pretty funny too. But then you've got some of these guys are in that and in supporting roles. And they're also pretty funny. Well, in this film, Garbo shows great range. She's funny when she's clipped and proper. But she's sweet when she loosens up. So you don't get this many laughs later on. But it's the Bill Murray thing in Groundhog Day. I guess that's what I compared a few minutes ago. I'll do it again. He's more likable when he's not as funny. But he's funnier when he's being a bit of a dick. She's not a dick, but she's just so serious. Melvin Douglas is very solid and pretty charming. The comrades are fun. And overall, this is one of the most hilarious comedies of the era. We almost always say most classic comedies don't make us laugh. But this one did. So that was how we saw Ninochka. In seven days, we'll be going from talking about this classic rom-com that Billy Wilder helped write to one that he both helped write and he directed it to. We've given it away already. His stars were William Holden, Audrey Hepburn, and Humphrey Bogart, and they were all making Sabrina. The coming attraction's opinion question for Sabrina. A lot of opinion questions lately. I can't think of any good trivia. But this is a pretty good discussion maker, and that's what this is really for anyway, the coming attractions thing. So, Billy Wilder is one of the greatest directors of all time, but especially at directing comedies. He made revered chuckle fests like Stalag 17, The Seven Year Itch, Some Like It Hot, The Apartment, One, Two, Three, The Fortune Cookie, and of course, Sabrina. If he's one of the greatest of all time at comedy, I think he is. Who do you say is the best of the past, let's say, 50 years since I was born? Because we post Sabrina not even a week after I turned 50. So the last 50 years, who's the best director of comedies since then? All right. So for our answers to that question, check out next week's podcast. 
about Sabrina. You already know how to find us, but let me remind you to favorite or subscribe wherever you listen, which is also where you can find our archive of hundreds of episodes that are available for free. While you're there, leave us a rating and a review. It's a great way to support the podcast. You can find us both on Twitter. I'm at Bev Ellis Ellis and Ryan is at MovieFiend51. I'm also on threads, by the way, at Bev Ellis Ellis as well. Or you can reach us by email. Have you ever seen podcast at gmail.com? And you can find our podcast on YouTube. Our channel is at H-Y-E-S Ellis. And to enjoy freshly roasted premium coffee delivered straight to you in Canada or the U.S., please go to sparkplug.coffee slash H-Y-E-S and enjoy a 20% discount. I'm getting the urge to flirt with you, so you better say cut because I don't think I can suppress it. (laughs) And cut. Suppress it.